Hello everyone. Oh my God. Today I have an expert with me here, a financial planner, not any financial planner, the financial planner, big Paul Retrieve. He's from ATB Wealth and this guy just knows almost every question you ask him. He knows everything about financial planning, wealth building, even a little bit of accounting. The guy is a wizard. And I could not believe when I asked him to give him a little bit of his time. And so I could ask him some questions that would be useful for everybody here. So thank you so much, Paul, for being here today. And if you could please just introduce yourself a little bit and tell people a little bit of your journey so they know who you are. And then we go from there. Okay, thanks, Pena. Look, uh, as Pena said, my name's Paul. I'm a uh a director at ATB Wealth, which is a financial planning firm uh, based here in Parramatta. Uh, I've got two other business partners. Uh, I've been in accounting and finance for about 25 to 30 years. Um, done a mix of accounting and financial planning during that stage. Uh, I've had an accounting firm and I'm a partner in that as well. And look, we got to the stage after all the different changes that were happening that we thought that we couldn't give our clients proper service unless we went and did the whole suite, right from accounting, tax, financial planning, just a whole lot. So that way we can actually give our clients a full service. And look, we've found that really successful because doing the planning and getting the tax right is uh, very important. So yeah, we think uh, we can do a great job for our clients. It can certainly be a uh, great help for them. Wow, that's so cool. Now, it's, it's good because it's almost like a one-stop shop, isn't it? That's right, yes. And look, we've got other relationships with uh, lawyers and all sorts of other people. So basically, yeah, we can offer our clients uh, every service that they require in that finance area. Now, I find, so as you know, as my accent as well tells, uh, I'm not from here. Uh, I'm from overseas. And where I come from, there is no such a thing as a financial planner. And I thought it, it was just me. However, every time I talk to, uh, sometimes I talk to Australians and I ask them, do you have a financial planner? They always tell me, oh, why do I need a financial planner? Or what is a financial planner? So could you kind of help us with that question? Why do we need a financial planner? Well, look, it is an interesting question. Look, it's a reasonably new profession. Um, Obviously, all the other professions have been around for a long time. Look, the good thing about having a planner is, as I said, it helps you plan your finance. Now, people, if they're building a house themselves, they get an architect, you know, if they're planning basically anything else they're doing in their life, they get an expert to help them. And yet, for some reason, we don't like talking to other people about our finances. You know, you have people who are married who won't talk to each other about their finances. You have people who have been neighbours or best friends. And... They'll talk about everything, but they won't talk about money. So Australians are a little bit shy about that. The reason, Look, there's many reasons to have a financial plan. Now, obviously, we can give a lot of help. We can be a lot of value for people. We can help you plan for retirement. Look, the legislation around a lot of the superannuation and investments is, can be complicated. So also you need help un, you know, unraveling the legislation. Look, there's a lot of ways. I think the guidance that we can give, the, the, the conversations that a financial planner starts, uh, when people come in and have the first conversation, the first thing we ask is, well, what do you want out of the plan? What's your goals? You know, what do you want to do in the next five years, next two years, next 10 years? When do you want to retire? What does that look like? And then once people tell us what their, their ultimate goal is, then we can set about making a plan of how they're going to get there. Some people say, oh, Look, I hate property. I don't want to touch property. Other people don't want to go into the shares. Other people want short-term stuff that they can um, be fairly liquid. Other people want long-term investments they can just set and forget. So the more information we get, then the more help we can be to people. We can help make them accountable to themselves. Like if you have a savings plan without somebody to guide you, it's very easy to uh, stop doing it after three months when things get a bit difficult. Um, so, yeah, look, it's guidance. It's mentoring, it's accountability, uh, you know, it's expertise, it's all of those things basically to help you get to the goal that when you get to 60 or 65, you can actually choose whether you keep working or whether you retire, whether you retire and how well you retire, which is also very important. 
I see. But sometimes when I talk to people, they say that only rich people have financial planners. Uh, is that because you are expensive or is that because only rich people can afford to have a financial planner because then you have something to play with? They already have wealth or anyone should, should get a financial planner? Look, it's especially recently with the, the new rules that have come in after the, the, you know, the new FASIA rules, it is probably more expensive now to get a financial plan up. Any advice we give, we have to do what's called an SOA, which is a statement of advice, and that will cost a minimum of two to $3,000, and the more complicated ones will cost more than that. So I suppose our, our, um, our thing is to give you good value. That's probably our our biggest challenge, right? So yes, obviously the more money you've got to spend, then the less of a percentage of your investment money than that financial, that cost will be. So I suppose we're there for everybody, but some people don't see the value in it. They think, oh, anyone can do what you do. So once people come and talk to us and see what we can do, I actually think they see a lot more value. So we could do a fairly simple plan for people who've only got um, simple needs, but even people who don't have a lot of spare money, just by helping with budgeting and getting saving plan going, I think we actually can still be very good value. And we certainly can help plan their super as well, because everybody's got super. You know, most people just keep it inside their fund that they get given. Maybe the one they started when they had started a job 20 years ago, they still got the same fund. Most people got no idea about the fees, how much money it earns, whether there's insurance inside there, all those sorts of things. So. Certainly there's a lot of help we can give to people even if they're not rich. So does that mean that if I have a superannuation account, it's always good to have a financial planner to look into it because probably I could be getting better returns if someone that actually knew what they're doing uh, put that into action for me? Look, most of the time, like for, you know, it doesn't cost very much, if anything, for someone just to do a comparison for you. So what a planner can do is just actually look at your fund. They'll look at the performance over the last five years, one year. Now, that's not necessarily an indication of what is going to happen in the future, but it's a good comparison. They can look at the fee structure and then they can offer some alternatives and then it's up to you if you want to take advantage of that. But certainly, it's like anything else you do in life. You, know, you don't buy the first house that you look at. You know, you, you don't buy the first car you look at, so why should you just go to the first super fund that you put money into, especially if somebody else has nominated it for you? So yeah, certainly getting a plan to look at your super is a great idea. Hmm. I think another thing, at least with my financial planner, is that it opened up my eyes to insurance. That, that was something that I never thought before. And now more than ever, especially in this current environment, having an insurance that protects you from trauma out protects you from uh income protection and all these things it's it's always a good conversation and it, it, it's usually a financial planner that opens that conversation isn't that right it is look insurance is, is something australians traditionally don't like paying for but as we say to someone you know the income that you earn during your lifetime means that you you are actually the biggest asset you'll ever have and most people insure again houses and cars they'll insure almost anything, but they don't like insuring themselves. So certainly if you take out a loan, a mortgage, then you should have life insurance because if something happens to you or your partner, if you're not insured, then the remaining uh, partner will probably lose the house or they'll be in, certainly in financial hardship. Now you mentioned trauma insurance. Well, that insures you against, um, as it seems obvious, trauma. The three most obvious traumas are heart attack, cancer or strokes. So this insurance means that you can get medical treatment, you can get um, money to pay if you're off work for six months or nine months or a year. Um, also, the medical treatment means you can generally get in quickly. If you've got the money, you, know, you can go private and get the operation done straight away or get the treatment that you need. Uh, income protection, uh, that ensures your income in a very broad sense. If something happens to you and you can't work, it can be you know, for as little as three months or it could be for the rest of your life until you're 65. Again, if you've got a mortgage or other debts, then obviously insuring that's very important because it guarantees your long-term security. Now, from my understanding, you don't pay for this insurance. Is that correct? Like, it, it, like you pay, but not directly. How does that work? Well, no, look, you do. 
Uh, look, life insurance and TPD, which is total permanent disability, can come out of your super. So that means it doesn't actually come out of your cash flow, but it still does come out of your super balance. So you have to be careful in thinking, well, I'm not paying for that because you actually are, because it's coming out in future income and pensions. But it still is a very cash effective, like cash flow effective way of actually paying for super. And again, especially if you're getting a mortgage, and most Australians actually do want to own their own house, then life insurance inside your super is a great way of doing that. Income protection is generally done in your own name, but because it's linked to your income, it's a, it's a tax deduction. So depending what tax rate you are, you could get almost half of it back as a tax deduction. Even people on the normal standard wage will get somewhere around 35 or 40% of it back. So that certainly does a lot to uh, offset the cost. And again, when you think of the long-term benefits, that's, uh, that's a pretty good benefit. Now, for example, as a salary um, and income protection uh, for a, a normal person, like with an average salary, let's say up to uh, 90K, how much would that cost a year? Oh, look, Peter, that's pretty hard to, uh, to answer. It will ensure up to 75% of your wage. Now, it could be as little as five or $600 a year. It could be a couple of thousand a year. Um, a lot of things come into it. it. depends how dangerous your job is. Like, obviously, an accountant or planner like myself sitting in an office, our job's a lot less dangerous than if you're working on a, a work site or if you're an electrician or if you're a truck driver. So a bit does depend on your income. It depends on your age. Like, Peter, yours would be a lot cheaper than mine because you're a little bit younger than me. Um, it depends on your health. Depends on things like if you're a smoker, you know, if you drink or don't drink, if your family's got a history of uh, certain illnesses. So that one there, actually, it's pretty hard to get the costing on. But again, all you can do is go and get a quote and then just see what comes back and see if that's suitable for you or not. Yeah, uh, the reason for it, it's more like to put it into perspective for people because most people, uh, especially smokers and, and people that love to, to, to eat out every day and do these things, uh, if you're talking about even $1,000 a year, how much is that per week, you know, to actually secure 70% of your income if something happens to you? Uh, wouldn't you be doing that? That that's for me. It's a no-brainer. I don't. Uh, uh, it it comes as a shock to me when you said that Australians don't like to pay for for insurance because just on that note, you would want to now. For example, if you made redundant or, or you just fired, then what? What are you gonna do? By having that little bit of protection there would be amazing, wouldn't that be? Well, not really, because income protection only uh, covers if you get hurt or injured. It doesn't actually cover if you lose your job. That's a different insurance called payment insurance. And that one there is generally taken out by your employer. But look, it is right. And look, even at the moment, most people's fears of their job is to do with the coronavirus rather than getting ill. But there are other ways still. People are still getting sick other ways. There's still car accidents. There's still... Many other things that are going to affect your job. And as you said, thousand dollars a year in premiums, you know, twenty dollars a week, you know, a cup of coffee a day, basically. And you know, if you're on ninety thousand, then seventy-five percent of that's you know, about what seventy-two thousand dollars a year you know, for a cup of coffee for until you're sixty-five. It's not really that big a cost when you break it down like that, is it? Yeah, that's correct. And being a young person, would you agree that most of us should be doing a salary sacrifice and putting more money in our super? Or do you think we shouldn't be doing that? Look, I think you should do some. Uh, look, obviously, if you're salary sacrificing your super, under the current rules, you can't access it until you're 60, on occasion at 55. So you do have to be careful, but super is a great way of saving because it's really a good tax-effective uh, way of doing it because... Um, now, your super is only taxed at 15% on any profits, whereas if you invest in your own name, it's obviously taxed at a much higher rate. Uh, look, I would do some salary sacrifice, but I wouldn't do right up to the limit necessarily because if you want to do something like buy a house or do other plans for the future, you know, buy cars, go on a bit of a holiday, if you trap your money in super, it's not uh, always good for that. So you've got, to, you've got to get a bit of balance. But certainly... The younger you start putting money in the super, you'll have a lot more in there once you retire. So certainly do some, you just don't do too much. Well, it depends. 
if you don't want to buy a house in the next five years, then start putting money in the super and then you can start saving elsewhere later if you want to you know, change what you're doing. And I guess these are all the important conversations you have with people when they come to you, isn't that correct? It certainly is. And look, you're talking about salary sacrifice because you get the tax deduction, like in other words, it comes out of pre-tax rather than post-tax dollars. You know, if you put hundred dollars a week in the super doing that, it costs you nowhere near that out of your salary because it's before you pay tax. Now, if you're at a 40% tax rate, then obviously it's only costing you 60% of what you're putting in. So it is a great way of saving for the future. So it's certainly a good way of doing it. And also the more you get into super, then the more it grows. Obviously, if you've got you know, 200,000 in there, if it earns 10%, that's a lot more money than 10% of 50,000. So the more you get in there, then the more it grows at a better rate. Mm. I guess, I, for me that I'm, I'm younger and a lot of people don't that are my age or even younger than me when you talk to a financial planner or any time of per, any type of person that thinks of retirement and talks about future it just seems to be so much in the future that we just think we have all the time in the world to to look into that later and later uh, but from my understanding um, the numbers that we end up getting when we retire with money in our super are not even enough for us to survive four to seven years. Is that correct? Well, the last stats I saw was that only about 10% of Australians actually retired with enough money to retire comfortably. So look, hopefully as more and more people have been working while the um, compulsory superannuation has been enforced, that there will be a higher percentage. But at the moment, look, most Australians retire with less than $100,000 in super. So that's nowhere near enough when you consider most people are used to living on a lifestyle where it's probably somewhere between forty dollars and $50,000 each after tax. Then obviously you've got two years worth there and there's a bit of pension thrown in and things like that. But obviously you can't get the pension at 60. So what it does mean is that people might want to retire at 60, but they might not be able to retire until they're closer to 70. And even then on a much reduced lifestyle. So then what happens is people might have to sell their house or move to an area that's a lot cheaper where they don't want to live or not do anything once they retire and just sit there and exist. So it is very important to make sure you do have plenty of money and the younger you start. And that's also the case with insurances. Obviously, if you get insurance when you're 25 year old and very fit and very healthy, it's very cheap. So it might actually be almost cheaper to get it at that age than to get it at 35 when you put on a bit of weight and your lifestyle is meant that you're not as healthy as what you were. So certainly starting all these things when you're in your 20s is a, is a great idea. Mm. And especially now, the Australians are living longer than ever before, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, if you look at the statistics you know, from um, back in the 60s and 70s, most people when they retired, they only lived four or five years, maximum 10 years after retirement was the average, whereas now, most people they retire at 60 or 65 assume they're going to live for another 20 years at least. So um, yeah, it certainly is a lot longer. And the last thing you want is to be in your late 70s or 80s, still in good health but having no money left. I think that would actually be really frustrating mm -hmm. and dangerous too because obviously if things start to go wrong for your health, you actually do want to have a little bit of money in reserve. Yeah. And one last question, it's about... Yeah self-managed super fund. I know a lot of people talk about this. So when is that that you get one and why you should get one or is it worth it to have one? Look, I will say that more people have self-managed super funds than what they should because a lot of people will get one and then they don't use it properly. So you've got to have a certain amount of money in super. The ASIC were saying the minimum was 200,000. These days they want you to have at least 300,000 in there to make it worthwhile cost-wise. Now, if you're just going to invest in direct shares or in funds, then you don't need a self-managed fund. It's really there for people who want to either really control their investments or if they want to buy a property inside their super. And that's probably the main reason most people do it these days is to buy a property. Again, you've got to have enough money in there to make it worthwhile. Uh, you've got to have a, a distinct reason for doing it. You've got to have an aim, you've got to have a plan. It can't just be, oh, I might buy a property one day. You've actually, you need to know what you're doing with it because the legislation around the self-managed funds is very tight. 
has to get an audit done every year, have to get accounts done on every year. When you do things, you've got to get statements of advice written. So it is reasonably expensive, but if you do it properly and you get the right property that you want and you use it and use it to build your super quicker, then it certainly is a good idea, but it has to be done with guidance and it has to be done with a reason. When you say costs, it's expensive, it's because you're the one having to pay for like the accountant, the, the whatever needs to be done. Uh, when it's a superannuation, you don't have to do much. You just pay their, the fees that are like minimum to your expenses. Yeah, look, there are fees on super, obviously, and there probably are more fees in there than most people uh, realise. But generally, 200000 was seen as a break-even point where at that stage, the self-managed fund wasn't more expensive than just having it in your own super. But if you've got a complicated plan and you're getting a lot of advice, and obviously you are going to pay more in fees than what you normally would be in super, but the return will probably be a lot better as well, and it'll also be much more geared to what you want to do. Again, if you want to get two or three properties inside your super fund, if that's the right thing for you to do and you get good advice on it, then you'll probably make a lot more money and increase the asset level of your super fund a lot quicker. So there are some advantages. you just got to do it properly. I see. For example, at the moment with all this corona crisis and all the stock market in the US going crazy, a lot of people suffered uh, a lot of losses in their super. Uh, what would be the piece of advice you would give to people if there is any? Well, it's pretty hard because unfortunately this is a once in a hundred year event. So you can't just look at prior things like the, um, the, you know, the GFC from 10 years ago and look, Look, the general advice is that the stock market always recovers. You know, if you look at any period since 1900, it's always finished higher in any given seven-year period than what it started. That's even during the Great Depression, during the market crash of 29, during the GFC, you know, the oil crisis. It's always finished higher. So my advice probably would be don't do anything at the moment because um, if you sell it, you don't lose money until you actually sell. And at the moment, if you start what you started, yes, it's gone down in value, but when the market picks up again, then if you haven't sold, you'll get the market going back up again. So generally people say that when the market's down, it's a great time to buy, but you should never sell. Mm. So that would be my right. Look, obviously everyone's going to have different circumstances. So this is when you actually do need a plan up. If you actually do want to get in and do some things on the market, then you probably should speak to someone because everyone's circumstances are different. But the general advice you'll give is, don't sell because then you actually do actually clarify the loss. So yeah. on that note, if, yeah. On that note, if people wanted to uh, extend this conversation with you and really wanted to get in touch with you, I know you're super busy, but what would be the best way of them contacting you? Look, um, ATV Wealth has obviously got a website that um, we could um, you could contact me from. Uh, it's also ATB Partners, the accounting firm. Um, look, definitely, yeah, give me a call. The first meeting that we do with clients for financial planning is always for free. We just sit there and have a talk, work out if we can help the person enough to be of value to them. They have a look at the services that we offer. They sort of work out if they think that we'll be a good fit for them. So, look, I'd say to anyone, just come and have a talk to us. We're always willing to sit there and have a chat with you just to see if we can help. And uh, yeah, I'd love for you to give me a call. Does uh, it need to be in the office or are, is it okay to do a Zoom meetings at the moment? Oh, look, Zoom, well, in fact, Zoom meetings are the only meetings we can actually do at the moment. So, uh, but look, our office is still working. Look, everyone's working from home, but our phone system still works properly. Um, you know, so look, yeah, just uh, give us a call, send an email, uh, contact us on the website. Uh, and look, yeah, just give us a call. As I said, we're very happy to have a meeting with you. It can be by phone, it can be by Zoom. Um, yeah, look, always happy to have a chat. All right, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave uh, your email address and your website in the description below. So if people want to contact you or contact the website, they can get in touch and ask for questions or ask for a meeting. Uh, I would like to thank you so much for your time, for stopping for a little bit and just answering all these questions. And I really hope you have a lovely end of the week. And uh, thank you again for your time. 
Great, Brian. Thanks. It's been great having a chat. Always. Thank you.